Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine Podcast. I'm Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. Hope you had a great week. In this episode, we're going to talk about the injury risk in CrossFit. Now, CrossFit is often scrutinized for having an abnormally high injury rate compared to other types of resistance training. To start, we have to define what CrossFit is. What is CrossFit? Now, the CrossFit website says that CrossFit is a fitness program that produces measurable outcomes through lifestyle changes centered on training and nutrition. Workouts consist of constantly varied, high-intensity, functional movements and are most fun and effective among friends at a local CrossFit gym. Now, that is a great piece of copy, but what actually is CrossFit? Well, CrossFit is a brand, but the training most commonly associated with it revolves around a workout of the day, or WOD, that combines elements of gymnastics, Olympic weightlifting, traditional resistance training, and endurance training. While there's no consensus definition of what is and what isn't a CrossFit workout, I think most will agree that the combination of these different training styles into a single workout done in a competitive setting, so something for time or for total reps, well, that's probably uniquely CrossFit. For reference, I've been through two CrossFit certification courses, a traditional level one CrossFit course in about 2009 and a level one MD course in 2018. I've also participated in the CrossFit Open in 2016 when I was taking a break from powerlifting and I've worked with a number of CrossFit athletes over the years. That's all besides the point though. Why are we even talking about CrossFit in the first place? Well, the CrossFit Open recently happened and, you know, this is something that hundreds of thousands of people complete worldwide to test their fitness annually. Uh, no, really, hundreds of thousands of people do this. In 2023, for example, over 300,000 people participated in the CrossFit Open. That's up 10% from 2022. So with all this recently happening, I figured we'd talk about the claim that CrossFit is a dangerous way to exercise. Now, this is not a new claim, as many in the strength and conditioning community have been saying this for decades. For example, nearly 15 years ago, Mike Boyle, he's a veteran coach, he said that, quote, high rep Olympic weightlifting is dangerous. Be careful with CrossFit. Around the same time, Another longtime coach, Alwyn Cosgrove, said that CrossFit's programming is all over the place and that there are more effective and safer ways to train. There have been other positions taken against CrossFit from both the ACSM via their Consortium for Health and Military Performance paper published in 2011 and the National Strength Conditioning Association's paper in 2013, citing a 16% withdrawal rate due to injury. CrossFit actually sued the NSCA for publishing false data, and a California federal court ruled in favor of CrossFit nearly six years later, finding that the NSCA did in fact falsify data, later awarding them nearly $4 million. All of this is to say a lot of people and organizations with large platforms have been suggesting that CrossFit is dangerous for a long time. So we're going to dive into the research here and see if there's any supporting evidence for this claim. But first a brief discussion about injuries. Now, when looking at injury risk during sport or activity, we're trying to determine injury rate, which is how many injuries occur in participants over a particular time. The injury prevalence is usually reported based on exposure to the sport or competition, most commonly per 1,000 participation hours. That's the good news. The bad news is that there's no real consensus about what an injury is. In the early 2000s, FIFA tried to suggest a suitable definition for injury, but it wasn't widely adopted. Heck, some papers that assess injury in sport or exercise don't even define what an injury is, despite publishing numbers on injury rates. The reason this matters is because the definition of an injury used can significantly alter the rates of injuries reported. For example, an eight-week-long study at an international volleyball tournament looked at the amount of injuries reported based on two different definitions. Using a time loss definition of injury, which is any physical complaint resulting in time lost from training or competition, the researchers recorded 23 injuries or 4.1 injuries per 1,000 participation hours. In the same group, but this time using a physical symptom definition of injury, where any physical complaint of pain sustained by a player resulting from a volleyball match or training, irrespective of need for medical attention or time loss from volleyball activities, well, that counted as an injury. And the researchers in this case recorded 33 injuries or 5.8 injuries per 1,000 participation hours. Those are much different numbers. So clearly the definition of injury matters when we are trying to assess injury risk, and because of the lack of a consistent definition, we should go into this review with eyes wide open about the quality of the data. I do think that it's likely injury rates would scale proportionally up or down with different definitions across different activities. So rather than focusing on the numbers being reported, I think comparing the rates of injury during one activity to that of another is more instructive. In other words, don't get caught up on the minutia, but rather let's look at the big picture relationships. With that in mind, let's start the discussion with the injury rate in more traditional forms of resistance training. 
on average, most forms of resistance training have an injury rate of about two to four injuries per thousand participation hours. Now, the majority of injuries observed in resistance training are not catastrophic in that they do not require specialized care and spontaneously resolve on their own with an average symptom duration of less than two weeks. For comparison, cycling has an injury risk of about 0.5 to 2 injuries per 1,000 participation hours, and walking for exercise has an injury risk of around 0.9 to 1.2 injuries per 1,000 participation hours, again, depending on the study's methodology and the definition of injury that's used. There's also a non-zero injury risk for just living, as one study elegantly showed. Now, in this study, nearly 200 previously sedentary adults were randomized into one of two groups. Group one did moderate to vigorous intensity cardio for six hours per week, whereas the other group didn't exercise. Now, the study went on for a full year, and at the end of the study, injury rates in those getting lots of exercise was almost the same as those who weren't exercising at all, about 28%. Interestingly, bodily pain reports were higher in the non-exercising control group compared to those who were exercising. Okay, so that's interesting, but what does the data say about CrossFit? Unfortunately, the majority of studies on injuries in CrossFit are retrospective, which means that the subjects self-report injuries that they incurred over a previous time period. While this type of study is fairly common in injury surveillance overall, it does increase the chance for recall bias to influence the study's findings. Recall bias occurs when participants may not remember previous events or experiences accurately and or omit details. Additionally, the validity of recalling an injury in retrospective injury surveys has not been shown to be high, even when assessed by trained medical professionals. Again, we're just going into this with eyes wide open on the quality of the data. Okay, on to the studies. One study surveyed 381 individuals who engaged in CrossFit training for four to five days per week for 30 to 60 minutes at a time to assess for injuries over the past six months. Injuries were defined as a new physical complaint that caused folks to stop CrossFit for greater than one week, modify their training for greater than two weeks, or visit a healthcare professional. 75 injuries were reported over the six-month recall period, which yields an injury rate of about 2.4 injuries per 1,000 participation hours. Another study recruited CrossFitters over the internet to answer a few questions, namely, During the past year, how many times would you say you've been injured because of your participation in CrossFit training, and how many times they did CrossFit per week? The study generated over 3,000 responses, with 30% reporting an injury related to CrossFit training in the previous year. Of those reporting an injury, 62% of the time it was a single body part, and 37% of the time it was more than one body part. The shoulders and back were by far the most commonly injured sites at 39% and 36% of injuries reported, respectively. The injury rate reported overall was quite low, between 0.27 and 0.7 injuries per 1,000 participation hours. Interestingly, more injuries were seen in those with the fewest number of weekly workouts, perhaps suggesting a sort of training paradox, where more training better adapts the individual to the demands of training, thereby lowering injury risk despite increased exposure. Finally, in the study, no significant differences were noted between age groups or sexes. Now, three studies compared CrossFit training to track and field, traditional Army PT, Olympic weightlifting, powerlifting, gymnastics, and running, with all three studies finding a similar injury rate between CrossFit and these other forms of exercise. Now, there are a number of different meta-analyses and systematic reviews of injury risk in CrossFit in adults, and these results are fairly consistent. A recent one from 2020 included 25 studies and over 12,000 subjects. 22 of the 25 studies reported an injury rate of about 2 to 4 injuries per 1,000 participation hours. The remaining three that were higher had a few interesting issues, however. One used an injury definition requiring only one day of symptoms. Another included a number of national-level competitors, which is not very generalizable. And the third one, well, the third one was done in untrained folks just starting CrossFit, which I think warrants some further discussion. Now, this study looked at 168 novice CrossFitters in Denmark and found that over eight weeks, there were 28 injuries reported, suggesting a much higher injury rate of 9.5 injuries per 1,000 participation hours. In this study, injuries were investigated using yes or no responses to the question, during the CrossFit experiment, have you had any problems, that is pain, soreness, stiffness, or swelling, related to your CrossFit training? If the participants answered yes, the participants were asked how long the problem occurred and to what extent it affected their training, either full participation without problems, full participation but with problems, reduced participation, or no ability to participate. Now, to qualify as an injury, the person had to have some sort of physical symptom, that is pain, soreness, stiffness, or swelling, that affected participation for at least a week. 
I think the short duration makes recall bias a bit less likely, but perhaps a certain time bias could be at play. For example, if the study had run longer and fewer injuries occurred than in the initial eight weeks, the injury rate would be lower. That's certainly possible, but the study could also be right. Perhaps the greatest risk of injury in CrossFit is during the first few weeks for novices, when they're relatively untrained and unadapted to the demands of the workout. That seems plausible to me, perhaps making the case that auto-regulation should be involved for the first few months of CrossFit participation in untrained individuals, so they can use things like RPE, time, load, or rep caps on workouts, and focus on pacing rather than testing one's fitness during a workout. My take is that it seems that CrossFit's injury rate is similar to what is seen in other types of resistance training at about two to four injuries per thousand participation hours. It should be noted that this is much lower than contact sports like rugby, soccer, and cricket, which have injury rates of 18 to 81 injuries per thousand participation hours. I do think it's possible, though, that there's a higher risk of injury in untrained individuals just starting CrossFit when compared to other types of resistance training. Additionally, a number of studies point out that injured individuals who are doing CrossFit get rhabdomyolysis sometimes. This is an extreme form of basically delayed onset muscle soreness where excessive muscle breakdown of the muscle cell, well, all the stuff that's normally in the muscle cell gets released into the bloodstream. The incidence of rhabdomyolysis or rhabdo is quite low overall, but it does appear to be higher in CrossFit and CrossFit type training than in other forms of resistance training. This is particularly true when there are other risk factors present like high levels of heat, high training volumes, and competition are combined. We talked about this a little bit in episode 266, so if you want to learn more about that, please check it out. I've linked that in the description below. Overall, I think that CrossFit is a fine way to meet or exceed the exercise guidelines, physical activity targets. I don't think that the data supports the idea that CrossFit is uniquely dangerous, not even close. Yes, there are risks and benefits to everything, even exercise. But the risks of exercise, including injury, tend to be massively outweighed by the benefits, even if that exercise is CrossFit. One final note on CrossFit. CrossFit is not my favorite flavor of fitness, and I have a number of issues surrounding the claims made about how well their training works, their nutrition information in general, and weird stuff they say regarding medical conditions. Still, I can't say with a straight face that CrossFit has been bad for the fitness industry. Quite the contrary. I think CrossFit has been one of the biggest drivers of the physical culture movement, particularly amongst women. And this extends beyond CrossFit itself. Exposure to Olympic weightlifting, powerlifting, and other subspecialties of CrossFit have increased participation in these sports markedly. The gym equipment industry has been revolutionized as well, thanks to CrossFit. Do you know how hard it used to be to get a barbell or to find a place to train while traveling? The popularity of CrossFit has been a blessing for the industry. All right, that's it for this episode of the Barbell Medicine Podcast. If you like this episode, please share it with a friend and leave us a five-star review. Have a great week, everyone. We'll catch you next time. Thank you.